De nuevo somos afortunados y es que hoy tenemos la suerte de hablar con Robin Ford, una leyenda del blues, del jazz y de toda la buena música en general. Va a compartir con nosotros hoy su experiencia. Robin, how are you? I'm pretty good, actually. I uh, just returned about a week ago from two week uh, vacation in Croatia. Okay, so you were in vacation in Croatia. Was it good? It's fantastic. Man. <laughs> so happy to hear that. Pure is your newest album. Will drop on August 27, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, so that's correct. We can only hear just a minute of each track uh, so far of the album in your website. So we can we had an idea of what we will find. But what can we expect of the rest of the album that we don't have heard yet? Hmm. <laughs> well, you were saying you you played a little bit of each song individually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, uh, I I would say this record is um, it's quite it covers a lot of ground, mm -hmm. and um, you know all of the influences of my entire musical life I feel are actually represented in this record, unlike any other record I've ever done. Um, it's an instrumental album, so that's unique for me for the last several years. Like my last instrumental album was Tiger Walk, which was 15 years ago. So my concentration, you know, uh, got clearly devoted to, you know, writing songs and good lyrics and being able to deliver, you know, a, a good song as a vocalist as well as an instrumentalist. So, uh, Things, um, you know, that I've listened to all my life as a musician, you know, not as a songwriter, singer, but as a musician, you know, an instrumentalist and a lover of uh, great music. Uh, there's, a, there's in, you know, uh, influence from classical music, Indian music, blues, jazz, rhythm and blues, and... Uh, It's funny, I was talking with someone yesterday about it. It's like, the one thing that you don't hear on this record is rock. <laughs> There's kind of no rock in this album, you know? Although uh -huh. it rocks, you know, and as far as I'm concerned, it, it rocks hard, but, you know, it, it also swings, which to me is kind of the differentiation, you know, between blues, rhythm and blues, jazz. Rock can swing, mm -hmm. you know, as demonstrated by ZZ Top and, and, and <laughs> yes. a few others. But in any case, there's probably a little of that in there, maybe. <laughs> actually, you, you mentioned something that was actually a question I had for you. I've been thinking about this question a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone who has mastered so many genres like you, does the line between genres become clearer or on the contrary, it becomes more blurred when you master them? Well, you see, I don't feel that I've mastered... Uh, But you a did. lot of things <laughs> that we're talking about here. <laughs> um, but um, the blues, I feel pretty, pretty strong, you know, mm -hmm. in that world. And I have, you know, the harmonic understanding to be able to play in a quote jazz, you know, setting, jazz context, um, musical knowledge, you know, harmonic knowledge. So, um, I think I had the very good fortune early in my career to be around uh, the top studio musicians in Los Angeles at that time. I was playing with the cream of the crop and I was just a baby, you know, I was 22 and basically a blues guitar player who wanted to be a jazz guitar player. So they introduced me to a much bigger world. You know, they were, they were able to fit into any context in a certain way. You know, I mean, maybe not heavy metal, you know, uh, their sensibilities were more akin to mine, you know. Maybe that, uh, was that late 70s, maybe? Mid. Mid 70s, okay. I, I joined uh, a group called the LA Express uh, and toured with Joni Mitchell in 1974. So during that period of time, I was introduced to so many Uh, great musicians, you know, got to play to some degree with a lot of the studio players. Mm 
Hmm. I was hmm. never a studio musician. This is something that you know uh, I have been accused of, <laughs> but I, I hate to put it that way. But I've always been kind of proud that you know I stuck to my own guns, you know, throughout my career. And yes, I did record with other people, and I did work to some extent in the studios in L.A. But I never did what people like you know Larry Carlton or Lee Rittenauer, who were my contemporaries, a little older actually than me, but. Uh, that was kind of the bag that I was dropped into, but my background's entirely different from those guys. I'm just a street blues guitar player, you know? So anyway, it was an incredible blessing to be introduced to playing in a variety of contexts, you know, different musical situations. And I came to, to learn to really love to accompany others, you know? And so that's where I learned how to fit in you know, to a variety of situations was, you know, just having fundamental musical knowledge, knowing chords, knowing scales. I didn't read very well ever. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, I listen, always ears wide open, you know? So you just, you listen to what's going on around you and, and you can find a way to fit in like, almost no matter what kind of guitar player you are, B.B. King could fit into anything if he wanted to, you know? He could find a way. And it's really that simple. It's like, no, even if this is Indian music, you know? Uh, you're like, ah, what do I know about Indian music, you know? But you listen and you go, okay, I can contribute this, this little thing, just, just sound you know, a, or a little rhythm, you know, like, so it's really just, uh, you know, that's the adaptability. It's like, you, you bring what you have to the table and it doesn't mean you're a master of, uh, of these things, you know, uh, but I learned how to fit in by being around great musicians who, who understood that concept. That's, that's a wonderful advice because, uh, especially for rock musicians like me, Mm -hmm. it's, it sometimes can get a little bit scary when you're trying to play a genre you're not familiar with and maybe yeah. thinking that you can actually contribute at least with a little thing mm -hmm. makes it a little bit less scary in a way. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's really just a matter of relaxing mm -hmm. and going, okay, what do I have? You know, what do I have to contribute? It can just be a pinch of salt, you know, but it's just enough salt, you know? Okay. So that kind of a, you know, like a confidence is important, you know, because I know exactly what you're talking about. Believe me, I was in so many situations where I felt so out of my depth. It's like, <laughs> why am I here? Why did they call me, you know? So it's really just a matter of relaxation and like being, you know, feeling good about yourself in what you do, you know? And then, okay, this is what I have to offer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think you gave, gave us a small gift of your, uh, your Robin Ford dojo. Yeah. This was like a little bit, a, a little piece of advice that you gave us. Tell us about the Robin Ford dojo. What's, what's that? Well, thanks for asking. Yes. RobinFordGuitarDojo.com. And uh, this is something that uh, my partner, Kelly Roberts, my girlfriend, who's also a, uh, a graphic artist and really smart. Um, she's uh, developed this, you know, mm -hmm. she's the website designer and uh, handles the website basically. And so I'm the content guy. And, you know, I, this began uh, with um, the Robin Ford Guitar Dojo channel at truefire.com. Mm -hmm. So I was using their platform, it was all my content. And basically I just put up uh, a beginning and intermediate blues guitar course. And there were other content, you know, there was some behind the scenes video and suggested YouTube videos and um, archival podcasts that I'd done. But this is a whole nother thing. We decided to just, we're just gonna do it ourselves. Close the Guitar Dojo channel at Truefire and opened our own website. So this thing has um, 
those courses, the, the intermediate and uh, beginning and intermediate blues guitar courses, uh, behind the scenes stuff, interview with great local musicians here in Nashville where I live and there's an abundance of them. Um, a complete rhythm guitar course, brand new, complete mm -hmm. rhythm guitar course. Uh, just a, a ton of stuff on, on there that we did not really do at the channel, on the channel. And it has a silver membership and a gold membership. And of course you get more with the gold. <laughs> uh, including a live Zoom hang once a month and wow. a live performance once a yeah, month. I, I noticed the live performance. So the members can enjoy a live performance by you? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's cool. We've done it. Uh, we did the first one, mm -hmm. which was uh, me with uh, a, a great guitar player named uh, Shane Tirio. And... Uh, great drummer from uh, New Orleans named Doug Belote. He and Shane are both from New Orleans. And um, uh, Steve Mackey on bass, who's just one of the great uh, local bass players here in town. And it was a live Zoom, you know, we did it in a, a club here in Nashville called The Five Spot, which is a really great little menu. And man, it's a, it's a show, you know? And uh, we, the second one, I was in Europe on tour with Bill Evans. So we arranged uh, through YouTube to broadcast the whole show. Okay. So that yeah. was, you know, live with that band, you know, with good camera work, you know. And now, uh, now that you mentioned it, I, th I think I saw the footage on, on YouTube. Now that you mentioned that, I think I saw it. Yeah. Yeah, it was broadcast there, but not in the United States. Okay. And no one knew about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was our second, uh, you know, those, these things are exclusive. Uh, okay. But because I was in Europe, the way it was done, it mm -hmm. was still pretty exclusive, you know, no one would have known it was happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now we're talking about how we're going to do the third one, because I'm actually going to be doing some dates here in the US, um, the 12th through the 23rd. Okay. And we were going to try to find a way to do it uh, from the road with my band out there. <laughs> uh, if that doesn't work out, then we'll do it at the end of the month and it'll be probably in that same venue. But yeah, a, a full, full, at, you know, at least an hour live performance, you know, every month with a band, you know, generally. Okay. Lately, we've been talking with some artists that also made live performance through Zoom or other platforms. And yeah. Some of them mentioned that it's a little bit hard sometimes to adapt the, to the fact that there's no crowd mm -hmm. giving you feedback. So you have to develop different approach for a live performance that's not uh, that's actually just just yourself just the band playing and you say yeah. something through the mic and there's no actual response <laughs> sure that's true it feels a little strange that way but the other side of it is you know it's live okay and uh basically you know it's about the music anyway mm -hmm. you know so i don't worry about it too much you know it's just like hey everybody hope you enjoy the the <laughs> show <laughs> you know <laughs> We don't really interact very much. We just play, you know, and the say guitar, thank you. Guitar speaks for itself. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so back to the album. When you were talking about the fact that you were doing instrumental work instead of uh, work with vocals, I was thinking, you have lots of experience. You're super experienced when it comes to writing, but do you ever find yourself in the situation where you're not sure if a song should have or not have vocals? Uh, generally, it's um, it's already decided up front. Okay. I'm either writing songs with lyrics or I'm writing instrumental music, you know. Okay. Yeah. There's always an intention when you start out. Mm -hmm. So there's a plan. There's a plan. And yeah. you start there and make the song chasing certain goal. Well, you know, it's usually, you know, when I write, it's because I have a record to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sitting around writing songs just for the heck of it. You know, there's always kind of a reason. And, you know, it's important really to have a, you know, like a, a deadline, a goal. You know, it's like, okay, you have to do this and you have to do it within the next three, four months, you know, it's like, okay get to work. <laughs> and uh, in this case, for me, 
as was Tiger Walk, you know, my last instrumental record, which was a long time ago, uh, the, uh, the notion of doing a completely instrumental album was kind of a relief, you know, because writing lyrics, man, that is, that's tough. That's hard. <laughs> it is. And uh, writing music, instrumental music, you know, I, I can kind of do that all day. You know, I, I love chords. I like melodies, you know, I like rhythms. And um, so that, that is not difficult for me, mm -hmm. which is not to say that, you know, things are necessarily written immediately. I don't mean that. Uh, and, um, you know, some things really take time. It takes a while before you find that next section to the song. You know, you got letter A, now what, you know? And you fool around, you fool around, eventually you stumble across something and, and, and it goes forward. And I really enjoy that process a lot. Writing instrumental music is, it's great. It's, it's just very freeing to me, you know, to, yeah, you know, melody sounds rhythms you know it's not like telling a story yeah <laughs> it is telling a story but it's telling it in a you know a strictly musical way you know i guess that instrumental gives you more freedom also in some structures because probably having vocals compels you in a way to make a verse a chorus or things like that i guess well yes um most most of my writing And I think this is common, you know, it's not unique to me. It, it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, you know, everything needs a beginning, a middle and an end. Mm -hmm. uh, like a story. Be, yeah, exactly. And so, the, you know, the, the music is like that too. You know, and I, I have actually pondered that a little bit because I noticed it happen, happen naturally. You know, it's at this, it, at, I'm at that point where it just sort of naturally happens, you know, mm -hmm. there need, there's a beginning and now, okay, you're in the kind of meat of the thing. And then, you know, a, a finish or a climax, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I really enjoy the process. And if I may wax a little bit about this new album, um, as I was saying, like all the influences are in there for me, you know, like kind of all the music I ever listened to there's some inspiration from all of that, you know, in this record and uh, including classical music. And, and I mentioned this because uh, my favorite classical composer is uh, Maurice Ravel. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar. <laughs> we, we know, we know. Okay, good. You know, a little side story. Um, when I was eight years old, my parents joined a record club And, you know, so you get six records a month or whatever, you know, you bought a stereo and joined the record club. And one of the albums was uh, uh, compositions of Maurice Ravel. One side of the record was Bolero. Yeah. And I used to conduct Bolero <laughs> <laughs> in front of the stereo when I was eight years old. I just love that piece of music, still do, you know. I can almost say it's my favorite piece of music ever written. It's beautiful. And uh, so um, one of the really uh, salient aspects of Maurice Ravel's work was he was an orchestrator. Mm -hmm. You know, he used the whole orchestra and he used it in a unique, beautiful way, you know? So for me, over the years, even, even within the context of great jazz or, you know, It, to me, any really great music, it's like the, all the instruments, they have their place, they have their reason. You use them when you need them and then you don't necessarily always need them. You know, everybody just like a band just starts playing and then they stop, you know, but the bass can lay out, you know, or the drums can stop, you know, or something else can take, the, the, take up the, the screen you know, suddenly, you know, and then go away and then something else is there. This instrument instead of that instrument, you know, no, this should be an acoustic guitar, not an electric guitar, right? All these things, that's orchestration. And uh, I learned this uh, basically through listening to classical music and also the great jazz players, man. And this is one of the reasons why Miles Davis is um, 
uh, recordings um, live at the Philharmonic. Uh, you may be familiar, um, two records, one's called My Funny Valentine and the other one's called Four and More. This was 1963 and Tony Williams had just joined the band and um, he was 17. <laughs> he might have been 18 by the time they made that recording. Oh my God. And they do this, you know, throughout the recording, you know, so, and this is just a quintet. So I've always tried to use my bands in that way. It's like, okay, stop playing for a moment. And it's just me and the bass, you know, okay. that, that kind of concept, you know, and this happens spontaneously when we're playing, I'll just go, Hey, lay out, you know? Okay. And that, gives the whole performance like a spontaneous quality to it you know because we don't know what's going to happen you know but we're just hmm. going for it you know so this is represented strongly on the new album this concept of uh, orchestration and we uh use the heck out of the studio you know for sounds and background noises and you know uh altering the sound of instruments, altering okay. the sound of drums, you know, guitar, bass, just distort the hell out of the bass all of a sudden, you know, just <laughs> So really, really worked with the, with the instrumentation that way to great success. I'm very pleased, man. So using the studio as an instrument itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I understand a lot better a quote by you saying that you see yourself more as a musician than a guitar player or, or as a musician before a guitar player. And now I understand because you're thinking of the, the whole thing. It doesn't yeah. matter the role of guitar or bass. It's the whole thing what matters. Yeah, that is right. And uh, it's, it is true that I, I do think of myself as a musician. You know, when I was younger, I thought of myself as a guitar player. Or a saxophonist. Well, you know, <laughs> a little, but uh, I put that away pretty early. Okay. I was never any good, but uh, with the guitar, you know, you, you, you're learning and you have your heroes and, you know, you want to be like your heroes. You want to be your heroes, you know? So there's that, it's all about the guitar thing, you know, yeah. but uh, that changed for me. You know, it just, again, I, I, fortunate for me, early 20s, man, I was 22. And these musicians who had, were very experienced and just done so many things already. Wow. I mean, Tom Scott and the keyboard player, Roger Kellaway, they were writing for television and film, you know. So Tom turned me on to Stravinsky, Indian music. Uh, he turned me on to a lot of music, man, that was, you know, I was unexposed to. And so I started listening to, you know, Aaron Copeland, you know, mm -hmm. and Stravinsky, Maurice Ravel. That period, it's a, just a great period. I, I think of it, it kind of goes hand in hand with, with the French Impressionist painters, right? Okay. Kind of the same period. Mm -hmm. And that's always been my favorite form of art, painting. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, the mm -hmm. French Impressionist period, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Picasso, you know, who is Spanish, as we know. <laughs> Miro, was he Spanish? Yes. He's not really an impressionist, though. He's kind of more of a modernist, right? A modernist? Uh, I'm not sure, since I'm not super expert on paintings, but mm -hmm. I know more That's impressionist that. because of uh, Van Gogh and, and others. Yeah. Yeah, that really is the impressionist period. Then I, I, I guess that period that I'm kind of referring to is like Picasso. Miro. Okay. They're abstract, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. abstractionists. Do you feel a connection between paintings that you like and music that you've made? Well, as far as I'm concerned, painting and music are identical. Wow. You know, one is sound, one's color. <laughs> That's right. Music That's right. is uh, superior though, in its ability to communicate. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's so beautiful. We can enjoy music and your music. Yeah. 
Yeah. Do you mind if I mention some songs that catched my attention from the last record and you make a comment of each one? Are you talking about the new one, Pure? Yeah, the new one. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed the intro for Dragon's Tale. Mm -hmm. It was a little bit special because of the sound and also because the, the, the notes that you chose were mm -hmm. special. What can you tell me about this song? Well, it was, it was one of the first things that I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, like the first three things that I was experimenting with was p the song Pure, um, Balafon, and Dragon's Tail. And so I just sat down with the guitar and almost immediately played that line. It was just sort of there, you know. So it took me a, a moment to get exactly the notes that I wanted, but the idea, mm -hmm. and part of it is, you know, it has to do with, you know, wanting to use open strings. Guitar record, twangy. Yeah. You know? So I was, it was very deliberate, open strings, you know, the use of. So that was kind of the, the, the idea and the inspiration for uh, at least the opening riff, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, I, I, I kind of struggled with it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it went through some changes. I, I changed keys, you know, in the middle of it. And, uh, you know, of what I was writing, it's like I moved, you know, what I had been playing in one key, I moved it to another key and it just gave it a lift. It was just suddenly hipper. And um, the, uh, the solo in the middle of it, which is probably, I mean, other than pure, it's kind of the most extended kind of, it's kind of a rock solo, right? Yeah. But it has all that, yeah, it, but it has all that jazz influence in there. Um, that was inserted because I had the song. It was sort of in three parts, right? Beginning, middle, and end, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. I, I just heard the first minute, so. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, because so, of the website, because of the website. Oh, I see, okay. Yeah, yeah. So yes, uh, they sent, uh, excuse me, um, it, ha it, it has three sections to, the, to it, the melody. You know, okay. There's that and there's a middle thing, and then there's, it really opens up into this more expansive thing. Mm -hmm. So we played it twice and it was done. And okay. there was no guitar solo. And I thought, I don't care. <laughs> <It's>, there's no <laughs> guitar solo. But I was in the studio doing overdubs and I thought, man, this should have a guitar solo. <laughs> So, Very so, nice. <laughs> um, so I, I, I sat down in the studio, we got a click track, just, just this, and then I put uh, a bass uh, on it. And then we kind of created a, some kind of a drum track. And I actually tried soloing it, to, soloing to it there. And it's, it, we, we actually did it live on Instagram, my, my playing, my soloing to that, we did it live on Instagram. And I actually thought maybe we'd captured the solo, but went back into the studio with my engineer, you know, in our workplace, you know, and it's like, we can do better. And uh, we overdubbed drums so that I could play to a drum track, you mm -hmm. know, a real drum track instead of a click track, you know, inspiring, or whatever. More inspiring and- Yeah, you know, some, mm. some power mm -hmm. and, um, really happy you know with okay. the guitar solo that, that's in there it's 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 the longest ex, it's the most extended guitar solo <laughs> on the record other than pure pure is quite long it goes on a long time man and that's the i, I was i'm using an indian scale there it's mm -hmm. very much influenced by indian uh, approach we even ha have tablas on it uh -huh. and uh, a friend of mine from los angeles playing the oud mm -hmm. Playing little oud riffs yeah, yeah. at the beginning. It's very cool. So um, uh, this one on Dragon's Tail, that's kind of the get down, you know, 
solo on the record a little bit more than anything else, even though the other things, you know, rock too. I look forward to listen to it, the entire song, oh, I mean. Man. I'm, I'm sorry you haven't heard it yet. I thought they would have sent it to you. you I, I, I get the record. I get the record for sure. Uh, <laughs> the next song I, I want to talk about is Pure, actually, because just okay. the, the first minute is super uh, exciting already. Compelling, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that was the first thing I wrote. Mm -hmm. And um, I was looking for just sort of a different sound. And that melody came once again pretty quickly you know i'm a very i'm a melodic guy i mean i have melodies going you know just all the time mm -hmm. melodies are i, I don't know they 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 don't elude me you know it's yeah. like if you play a couple of notes it already is kind of taking you to the next notes and, i feel and and do those melodies come with the chord already in your mind or you play a lot until you find the right harmonization Well, generally, you know, uh, it's pretty much the, the case with everything on, on this album. Um, uh, the, the melodies basically uh, are played against one, you know, kind of a, that, that song in particular, there, there are no chords in it. Mm -hmm. Chords mm -hmm. are insinuated. You okay. know, there's, it sounds like there's some chord changes in there, but it's really just the melody doing its thing. And um, so, yeah, that's pretty much the case throughout the record. I, I'm not really, uh, I, I didn't write, well, it's not true actually, uh, <laughs> to be true, <laughs> clear, you know, because there's a couple of other things. I, you, you would have heard them. I, I, I guess you've only heard them once, but there's a song called Balafon and it's basically yes. a chord melody. Hmm. And it kind of rolls out, you know, and it, I, I do sort of like go, how can I make this a little bit hipper, you know, little <laughs> hipper chords against this melody, the melody is kind of there. Hmm. And then I'll, I will kind of search for this chord, that chord, this chord, you know, a little bit, but it just seems like it, it's, it's just there. Like, I always feel like a song is, it's just there mm -hmm. waiting for you to pick it up. <laughs> you know, you, you open the door and then it's just kind of all there and you just got to go in and pick it up. You know, <laughs> I, I wish it was that easy for, for the rest of us. <laughs> well, I think you just, you know, if you know chords, mm. see, first of all, you have to know chords. Mm. That's the door opener. If you know chords, you know, like I learned all my chords out of Mickey Baker Jazz Volume One. Okay. Every chord I know. Mm -hmm. volume one you wow. know <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I, i i know the basic jazz chords and fortunately you know those chords basically all of music is contained therein you know if you listen to a, a composition of maurice ravel it's a minor seven flat five d seven you know mm -hmm. to e minor seven to g major seven it's it's the same thing You know, he's just really expands it, you yeah. know, but basic harmony, you know, it, it, it's all the same, you know, for any genre of music, it just depends on how far you want to take it, you know. Okay. Okay. And the last song I wanted you to talk about is Blues for Lonnie Johnson, Lonnie Johnson mm -hmm. singer from, from New Orleans. Hmm. Why the Was title? Lonnie Johnson from New Orleans? Is Why? Lonnie Johnson from New Orleans? I think so. Yeah? I mean, he's a Am guitar I wrong? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. We're going to find out right now. Because I was actually speaking with someone about this, about him, uh, just the other day. And um, because he thought Lonnie Johnson was a, a Delta guy. I, I think so, because I wanted to know more about this song and, and I was thinking why Robin named this song after Lonnie Johnson and I looked for some information and I think he's born in New Orleans, but I might be wrong. Well, the guy I'm looking at here is, I don't think is the Lonnie Johnson I'm thinking of. Okay. So it's, this guy is from uh, Mobile, Alabama. Okay. So uh, it's it's not... 
about oh no he's this guy's from is an aerospace designer sorry okay okay <laughs> wrong guy it, it would be cool uh, to make a song about an aerospace designer too <laughs> lonnie johnson um uh, is a, a blues guitar player singer from the mm -hmm. 30s and 40s mm -hmm. and his thing was much more akin to like um t-bone walker mm -hmm. he's out of that school okay and um really uh Lonnie Johnson was more prevalent as an influence for me on my album, Bringing It Back Home. I don't know if you ever heard that record, but basically the entire record was played on an Epiphone Riviera on the rhythm pickup, and I never got loud. Just one pickup, one tone, straight guitar. And I love that. And that's Lonnie Johnson. So this is um, one pickup, one guitar, but it's really loud. <laughs> and uh, and it's a straight up blues, and mm -hmm. I just felt like I, I just felt that I, I wanted to tribute him in some way. I don't I don't think people think about Lonnie Johnson too much, man. You know, he's really a thing of the kind of distant past. You know, it's beautiful. But have you ever seen you. these things? There there was a series of um, videos. Um, it was uh, I think referred to kind of as the British Blues Festival, and it was all these American you know, black American blues artists, um, like for three or four days in Europe somewhere. It was probably a European tour. Mm -hmm. And it was videoed and it's available on, on YouTube. Helen Wolf, John Lee Hooker, Little Walter, Muddy Waters, Sonny Boy Williamson, all these guys. Well, 1963. Mm -hmm. you, should, you should check it out. I'll check it out. Otis right Rush. after this interview. <laughs> okay. And uh, Lonnie Johnson is uh, is in there. He performs. Wow. Okay, so let's talk about gear. I don't know if we have, we have more time. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you, Robin. Let's talk yeah, about gear. What gear did you use for this record? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, song by song, you know, almost, you know, at least in the guitar department. You know, I, I used uh, my 64 SG, my 60 Telecaster, my 51 Telecaster. Wow. <laughs> my uh, Gibson uh, 355, which is a 64. Uh, Epiphone Riviera, which is a 65. Uh, Paul Reed Smith, two different Paul Reed Smiths. Wow. So it's just all over the place, you know, <laughs> and uh, primarily small amps. Um, I used uh, a Vibrolux uh, custom that I've, that I've had modified a little bit. It's got a bigger transformer, so it's much cleaner. Okay. And uh, also a lot, probably the amplifier that I use the most on the record is an amplifier called Little Walter. Are yeah. you up to Little Walter? I've, I've seen you with it. Mm -hmm. in the YouTube it's videos. It's a 50-watt head. And uh, a lot was done through just one 12-inch uh, speaker. So a 50-watt Little Walter head and a 12-inch speaker. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a Celestian, sometimes uh, I don't even know what's in that cabinet because it belongs to a friend of mine. <laughs> and uh, a couple of cases, I, I used the Dumble Overdrive Special um, with the 2 by 12 cabinet, my usual rig, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's on White Rock Beer, eight cents. Uh, blues for Lonnie Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, this, and the solo on um, uh, Dragon's Tale was also using the Dumble Overdrive Special. Otherwise, I was using this little Walter 50 watt head. Okay, okay. Robin, I think you're the right person to explain to anyone who doesn't know nothing about the Dumble. Yeah. Why it is a legend? Well, I don't know if you know this story, but um, hmm. basically, <laughs> kind uh, of. Alexander, you do. Okay. Kind of, but I, I want to hear it from you. Sure. So uh, Alexander Dumble used to see me play up in Northern California. He was, he, he was uh, living in Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. And I used to play around Santa Cruz and, you know, San Francisco, Northern California area. 
a lot with my brothers, Charles Ford Band. And um, so he, I, I, I remember meeting him. It's, it's really interesting. I just have this picture of him at this club I used to play in Palo Alto, sitting in a chair and he, and he talked to me a little bit. And I know it was him. <laughs> I can't guarantee it, but I'm sure. So anyway, <laughs> Uh, years later, uh, I was um, desperate to find an amplifier that I liked. I was very unhappy with my sound, my guitar, my amp. And uh, this is the early 80s, like 82. Mm -hmm. And um, I met this guy named Andy Brower, who used to have a, a gear rental shop, vintage gear rental shop in Los Angeles. And um, he introduced me to a double head. He had a 100 watt double head very early head you know and uh i played through it and i'm like this is what i've been looking for my whole life you know yes it was super expensive i still hadn't met alexander and uh, so i used to rent it from him when i had a gig and play it through a single well 12 cabinet that i had so eventually i'm like i just need to get one and so i got alexander's uh number and i called him up and uh, I said, I'd like, you know, I'd like you to build me an amp. And I, I don't remember if he told me this story before or it seemed like it was later. You know, I, I don't remember if it happened like upon our first meeting because it, it should have. But in any case, he, he told me eventually, he said, you know, Robin, I, I, I got the idea for the Overdrive special listening to you play through a Fender Basement <laughs> piggyback. And it gave me the idea, and uh, he developed the Overdrive Special. And people like Lowell George and uh, David Lindley were playing through that amplifier before I was. <laughs> but it was just those guys, because they, you know, they, Dumble had connected with that kind of Southern California rock crowd, you know. Bonnie Raitt, you know, she tried them, she moved away from it. But Lowell George was playing through a combo. And um, David Linney was too. Uh, and I don't know if those guys ever played through the, uh, the um, you know, the Overdrive Special uh, combo head necessarily. They probably tried it at some point, but I fell in love with it, started playing it. And after that, Larry Carlton got one. And after that, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan got one. He, he didn't, not because of me, but, um, he had played through uh, Jackson Brown's uh, combo mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for his first record. And so he fell in love with the Dumbo right there, you know? And um, yeah, Eric Johnson got a steel string singer. He moved away from that, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it started a role after I uh, started playing the amplifiers. My favorite part of the story is where you try an amp and you love the sound without even knowing that the sound is inspired by your own sound. <laughs> exactly. I know. It's fantastic. It is. <laughs> I'm great. very happy about that. I'm very proud of it because the Dumble Overdrive Special has become the most desirable amplifier in the world. <laughs> I'd like you to, to ask about technology because now, of course, Dumble is so popular that uh, every kid wants to have some kind of dumbbell sound. So what they do is to use digital multi FX emulators and plugins. How do you feel about this new wave of technology that's mm. trying to replace tube amps? Well, I think that, oh, trying to replace tube amps. You're talking about digital no. technology in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's terrible. <laughs> And uh, at the same time, who knows, you know, it's like e everybody is kind of attached to their era and thinks that it was the best era. Mm -hmm. But even that is not always the case, you know, like it it's incredible the extent to which uh, Led Zeppelin had, you know, became even, you know, much younger generations favorite band they are the most enduring influential rock band of all time, you know, even today. 
Yeah. And any real musician, you know, be it rock, you know, blues or jazz or whatever, they're going to go back, you know, you go back. And the 60s was just a crazy period of creativity and everything coming together, you know. And, you know, over time, when digital technology started coming in, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's done almost nothing to enhance music, real music. It, it's, it's pop art. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, at best, you know. Um, like a factory well, that reproduces. Well, you know, it's digits, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's no heat. <laughs> you know, there's... There's no, you know, nothing's flying around in there, you know? Hmm. I mean, we need things to breathe and move, you know? That's, mm -hmm. that's life, you know? So for me, digital technology, is, it has not had a good influence. And it's a, I think it's, uh, I've invented what I would think of as a pretty funny quote, which is technology should, should have ended with the electric guitar. <laughs> Stop right there. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the quote for this interview and you know it thank you <laughs> robin these are people you have worked with george mm -hmm. harrison <clears throat> mm -hmm. miles davis yeah johnny mitchell bob dylan john scaffield john mayo what what do you feel what has changed inside you after working for all these gigantic artists well um you know i i always like to say that the best period in my life uh was the two years i spent with joni mitchell mm -hmm. uh because she was a consummate artist you know i mean still you, you you can't name anybody that would have a higher status you know in terms of being a great creative you know, musical artists. There just aren't any. And she, she's better than many, if not most, just in terms of the extent of her creativity, you know, incredible. So that is an amazing, you know, I, that was an amazing privilege that I still cherish. I, I learned more during that two years with her than at any other time in my life before or since. Wow. And, um, Then, of course, uh, so that was the learning, you know. Uh, playing with Miles Davis was, that was like knighthood. So what that did for me was gave me a confidence that um, I didn't quite have at that time. I was like 30, 36 maybe mm -hmm. when I played with Miles. And so a good point, you know, at which to have that experience, you know, like young enough and old enough. Okay. Old enough to be there in the first place and young enough to be in awe, you know, mm -hmm. of, you know, I, I, I really think Miles Davis has been the most influential artist on me musically in you know, in some ways directly and in some ways indirectly by the people who came out of his camp, you know, like Wayne Shorter. I mean, Wayne would have done his own thing anyway. He kind of enhanced Miles more than Miles enhanced him to some degree because of his composition. But nonetheless, Wayne learned from Miles Davis too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's just this link. I, I, I feel... You know, with, with those experiences, working with Jimmy Witherspoon when I was 20, 21, my favorite blues singer, Jimmy Witherspoon, uh, at that age, you know, I'm working with my favorite blues singer. Wow. So these things, wh what they did to me was made me feel a part of the, the musical line, you know, like a part of the, the thread of kind of musical history in, in a way, you know, like... I swam in that river, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> al alongside the greats, you know. And I don't claim to be one of them, but I was there <laughs> and I got a lot out of it. And it made me feel, as I say, a, a confidence, you know, in myself 
It's like, well, if these people like having me here, then I guess I belong here. So that would be the great gift of these experiences, you know? You certainly made music history. It's, it's fabulous yeah. what, well, what you did. Well, thank uh, you. Robin, could you give us an advice, especially for young people out there who are trying to be a guitar player nowadays? A guitar player? Yeah. yeah. Or a musician? Yeah. Musician. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, let's talk about it from a guitar player's perspective. Yeah. Who is a musician? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, be, be a musician, first of all. <laughs> If you're a guitar player, <laughs> be a musician. That would be my first advice. <laughs> But, you know, the way that I got there, you know, uh, first of all, I, I always loved... Uh, beautiful music um, and I eventually learned to love very funky music you know so loving music loving the things that you play you know? and uh, that that you know this, this music must be in your body you know it, it can't be on the on the fretboard and on your guitar and in your amp you know it has to be in your body so that the feeling of it that you know the whatever whatever started that music, you know, needs to be inside you. Like you get it, you know, you feel that way too. Be it something beautiful or something gnarly or something, you know. So really, you know, that's kind of the soul thing, the heart thing, you know, like that's, that's, that's uh, number one uh, for you to ever make any really great music. And so as a guitar player, learn chords, That's always my first advice. Learn chords, man. And if you learn chords, it opens everything. You know, you can play anything. If you know chords, you can play any song, you know. And you can even start to understand, you know, uh, classical music, how it moves, you know, because, oh, yeah, I hear that. You know, that's, that's an A chord, and now that's an E chord with G sharp in the bass. I hear that because it goes do, do, do. D sharp over D, you know, those kind of things, you know, from knowing chords. And so you can understand music, you know, uh, much better if you do that. And um, also, it's, I think it's really good to really in, immerse yourself into one style, at least for a while. You know, don't try to play everything. People used to go to MI or, you know, a variety of music schools and You know, they'd be taking a country music class, a blues class, a jazz class. You know, I don't think that's the proper way for someone to learn. I think that's not good. And you should immerse yourself in, in one style. And for me, that style Focus. was blues. Yeah. Hmm. And so, you know, I learned how to play the blues, man. You know, like, and so th that was my foundation. And I was able to go... Then I learned chords. <laughs> you know, the blues is three chords, you know. So um, I knew the cowboy chords, as I like to call them, you know, C, G, <laughs> you know, D. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, I learned how to play a ninth chord. And so then I could play the blues, you know. And <laughs> that's all I played was ninth chords and blues riffs, you know. Uh -huh. But... I got steeped in that music and I was playing with Jimmy Witherspoon when I was 20 years old, you know? So dig deep into one genre. And then I think it is wise to, okay, let's go further, you know? So learning chords, listening to jazz, then listening to classical music and listening to Indian classical music and the whole thing just kept expanding. So, you know, like, Something I'm proud of, if I may say, is that I, have, I haven't made one record that sounded like the one before it. Mm -hmm. Every one of my records is different than the other one. So that's just, you know, like music, you know, not just one thing, you know. And so I think people can get kind of uh, bogged down. Uh, and I, I, you look at the Rolling Stones, I mean, come on. Really? <laughs> I'm not saying they're not great, but they don't play any better than they did when they were 18. <laughs> you know, they haven't become better musicians, man. 
So to me, you know, it's important to become a, to grow, you know. So don't stay in that one box too long. Robin, that was fabulous. Thank you for your advice. I'm sure that lots of uh, Spanish guitar players will enjoy this interview a lot, having the chance of hearing you talk directly to them. So thank you so much for your time. Well, my pleasure. And Spain has always been seriously one of my favorite places to play. And I can't wait to get back there, you know. It's We're looking forward to it. We're looking you forward too. to it. Thank you so much, Robin. Pleasure talking with you. Pleasure is mine. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.